Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, latest edition of our leadership series. Today we have what is sure to be an informative and entertaining session with Kim Ang, General Manager of the Miami Marlins, in a conversation with Mark Cannon, Executive Vice President and Chief Experience Officer for AutoNation. Before we begin, I want to thank our series sponsor, JM Family Enterprises, listed on the screen, and the South Florida Business Journal, our media sponsor. And now on to our program. Today's moderator is Mark Cannon, a great friend and an Executive Vice President and the Chief Experience Officer for AutoNation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce my good friend and a great friend to our community, Mark Cannon. Mark? Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. And we have an unbelievable guest who happens to also be a personal friend. Kim made um, major league history when she became the first woman uh, general manager of a major league baseball team. And um, her, her bio is incredible. She has begun all the way at the bottom and worked her way up. And now uh, she is running one of the most dynamic teams, not just what's happening on the field, but what is also happening in the front office. So Kim, welcome. And I'm so glad to have this chat with you. I look forward to it. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Really happy to be here. Yeah. So Kim, let's let's talk a little bit about how you got started. And I know that you got started in Chicago and talk a little bit about the start of your career, because that really laid the foundation for you to be the first female general manager in baseball. Yeah, no, it did. I um, So I went to the University of Chicago, uh, majored in public policy, which is so far from being a baseball executive, but um, it did place me in the proper geographical position to, to get my first internship with the Chicago White Sox. Um, so it was there, I was hired by Jerry Reinsdorf and his staff. Um, and it was a man named Dan Evans, who later became general manager of the Dodgers, but he really gave me my first start in baseball. And I think a big part of that was um, his wife was a sports producer. And he saw a lot of the issues that she went through and being in sports and being a woman. And I think, you know, he just naturally went to the best qualified uh, person for the job and really was blind to gender. And I think, you know, him, him being married to Susie and, and you know, her position um, really opened his eyes as to some of the things that women dealt with um, back in those days, as well as still to this day. Um, but that really set the foundation for me is working for the White Sox. Um, started out as an intern in 1990 and then went to become full-time 1991. And I did all of the, um, you know, the, the messy work, the uh, grunt work, um, inputted scouting reports, did the radar gun, um, you know, approved expenses, learned about the basic agreement, started in on arbitration. So you know, Kim, that one of the things that when you and I were talking one day, you said to me all the messy work. And you said that it was sort of like they threw every challenge they could at you to see if a woman was going to be able to cut it in, you know, in what at that point was very much a man's world in the whole baseball thing. Okay. And you told me that you never turned down any opportunity, whatever they threw at you, you took on. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, a huge part of the learning process. And, you know, when, when a lot of the younger um, um, executives slash junior staff come in and ask me for my, my advice, I mean, that's one of the biggest things I tell them is that you have to roll your sleeves up. You know, when you walk into somebody's office, that's the first impression they have of you. And you have to be willing to do anything. And but that's how you learn. What was your favorite job at the White Sox of all the things they threw at you? I was it holding that gun. It was. <laughs> it was. It really was. Standing behind the plate, um, doing manning the radar gun, and then signaling up to the general manager and the assistant GM, you know, the um, you know, the velocities, the velocities and the pitch types. So, you know, I was a softball player in college, um, really hadn't played baseball, but so that was a learning part, you know, being able to decipher pitch types, et cetera, but, but feeling like you were relaying important information, you know, during the game was, um, was pretty much a hoot. And then, you know, your parents seeing you on TV, um, standing behind the plate was, was fun as well. So, um, by the way, you're still a White Sox fan. You know, I'm a White Sox fan for the people that work there and for Jerry, you know, obviously gave my first opportunity. Yeah. So, um, 
let's talk about your next step in baseball, which was a team I hate. <laughs> everybody so, would know because everybody knows I'm from New England. So of course, I am a Red Sox fan and there's only one team every Red Sox fan hates. So talk a little bit about that. Okay, so I'll give you one step before that. I went oh. to the American League office for 14 okay. months. And that's where I actually got to know Brian Cashman of the Yankees fairly well. So that is now foreshadowing for my next um, step, which was being becoming assistant general manager of the Yankees. Um, I was there during a really magical time in their history, um, 1998 to 2001. Um, so sorry, Mark, um, not so not such good years for the Red Sox, but <laughs> but, um, you know, I got to work for Brian Cashman, um, worked there with Joe Torrey, um, who became very instrumental in my career. Uh, but it was really just a, a magical time in, in the history of the Yankees. Um, in 1998, we won 114 regular season games. 125 on, on the whole year. We went to the World Series and swept the Padres in four. Um, and it was really sort of an interesting um, look for me because that was, sorry, Mark, that was really the ideal in terms of how you'd like to build a club. Um, you had strong defenders everywhere on the field, strong defenders up the middle, but also offensive. You know, and back, you know, 25 years ago, that really wasn't, um, you know, the model. Um, you what know, did you, you, and what did you take away from the Yankees that you brought to the Marlins? You know, and I think <clears throat> some of that had been set before I got here, but I think, you know, in addition to me being a former Yankee, I think the, you know, the, the drive that you have to win every single day and the high expectations that you set for yourself and for your teammates, um, you know, I think, you know, the idea that we wanted to be a first class organization, um, you know, day in and day out. And that means, you know, obviously those guys out on the field, but also, you know, inside the organization, you know, what these players experience as minor league players coming through the system, you know, some of the things that we look for when we draft them. So I think we brought a lot of those principles here. And, and let's now kind of move to the Marlins today. Uh, how would you define the key things that are, you're responsible for? So I'm in charge of the entire baseball operation. So that it includes everything from the time that we acquire players, whether that's international um, pro scouting. Um, so that means, you know, trades for, you know, from other minor league clubs for the amateur front, domestic amateur. So that's the draft that's actually coming up this weekend. So that's all of the acquisition um, paths into the organization. And then I'm also in charge of those minor leaguers when they you know, make their way up through the system to then the big league club. You know, and that's the, the, the product that you see out on the field each day um, you know, and, and that major league field staff. So you know, all the way from acquisition to what you see out there every day. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a lot. Um, I should also mention international. We have our Dominican Academy. Um, we're opening, we're actually opening up a beautiful facility in a couple of months. Um, in my opinion, and so I, I was SVP of international baseball ops at, um, at major league baseball prior to coming here. And so I was down in the Dominican probably half a dozen times a year. Um, the Dominican being one of, well, being the biggest foothold we have outside the US. But I would travel down there six times a year and I would go to see all the academies. Our academy undoubtedly will be, when it opens up in a couple of months, will undoubtedly be um, the best, the biggest, and just really the, the crown jewel of the island, in my opinion. Um, that's, see, that's fabulous. So, yeah. so you're not just looking at uh, today in your job, you're looking at the future. You're Absolutely. trying to, and you know, as much as I hate to say this, that is something the Yankees have done an incredible job with, is they're always two steps ahead. So I assume the Marlins are going to take that same position. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's what we try and do here every day. And it's not just to, you know, try and get that win um, that particular night, but to be looking, you know, several years, five years down the line and really trying to, you know, striving to be best in practice. You know, I've had a chance to really get to know your organization. You know, everybody knows we're a huge sponsor and we just signed up for another two years um, to be part of your uh, organization. We love what's going on down there. And, you know, I've, I've a chance to work with David and Caroline and I 
gotten to know Bruce pretty well. Uh, he and I played golf recently, which by the way, you still owe me a golf game, but we'll talk about that tonight at the game. Um, but uh, I've gotten to know, and let me tell you, the diversification that you're doing in the organization with uh, diversifying, is there another team in Major League Baseball that's even attempting to do what you are? I mean, look, Caroline, if I'm not wrong, she's the COO, right, Chief Operating Officer. You're the first female general manager in baseball. And I mean, that says a lot. So is that the mentality of the organization? Is that something you're striving for? And I think Rocky is, Rocky obviously has got the Marlins Foundation and stuff. So talk to us a little bit about that. I, I mean, I would venture to say the Marlins are um, best in class in this particular area. Um, I think it's been at the forefront of the organization's mind for the last you know, several years. Um, you know, I, I would dare to say that Caroline and I, um, you know, I don't know that there's a leadership team, um, you know, that is all women like that in professional sports, um, at least in this country, um, <clears throat> particularly on the men's side. Um, so I think that's really a credit to, you know, ownership and really the way that they drew it out here, I think, when they took over. Um, I'll tell you about, i tell you ownership. I, I've gotten to know the owners of, of the team and the investments that they have made in the facility. And the investments they're making in the minor league and moving up with what we just talked about Dominican are really outstanding. And I, and I tell you, I hear people in Broward say, well, it's going to Miami. Let me tell you, I go down, I try to get to at least 10 games a year. It is worth going down to see this team. And um, I, th I think what's going on down there is very, very exciting. And as Bob said earlier, sports is such a key part of any community. And the Marlins are, are really doing fabulous work. So how do you get the players to be involved in the community? Because I know that's, that's one of the missions you all have, and I know that's something important to you. You know, I think it's really to make sure that they understand that this is a, a major tenant, a major pillar of the organization. And I think that starts from top down. Um, I'll give you an example. And, it, you know, it starts with, you know, our leadership group and, and as well as me. You know, and I'll give you an example. We have an event this weekend, and... You know, I personally signed letters, invitations, asking them to participate in that. You know, and we made it really formal um, and they're receiving those invitations, uh, I believe today to participate, but they have to know that it is meaningful from the top down. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we also try and do is we, we try and grab this issue from the bottom up and that is teaching them, you know, while they're at the Academy in the Dominican, while they're at our, um, you know, Jupiter complex, uh, you know, when they're very low in the minors, that this is important to the organization. And I think this idea of reciprocity and giving back um, and advancing the ball forward is something that, you know, we as an organization really strive for, and we have to make sure that these fellows know it as well. Let's talk about tonight's game a little bit, because I'm coming tonight's game. You got the most dynamic pitcher, I think, in baseball. You know, kills me to say that, but, uh, you know, being a Red Sox Padres, but th this Sandy is unbelievable. Talk a little bit about Sandy. Talk a little bit big series this weekend. I'm rooting for you guys because really puts you into playoff contention. You guys are on a real roll right now. So talk a little bit about the development of somebody like Sandy, because obviously that's in your world and where you're headed this season. So it's interesting. I you know. So I've I've only been here for a year and a half or so. So I don't know. I. I do not know Sandy from when he was, you know, um, an acquisition, you know, that we brought into the organization. Um, but from everything that I understand, um, you know, he was a typical young player and, you know, didn't necessarily have his routine down properly. Um, didn't understand what it was, uh, what it meant to be uh, a professional, but through our, our staffs, you know, both minor league and major league, um, you know, he was able to develop. Um, Mel Stoudemire, I have to give all the credit in the world to, um, you know, taught him a great changeup and has really stuck with him. And, you know, Mel is great. He talks to his players every single day, you know, whether they're on the hill or not. And I think that's really important in their development. Um, you know, so Sandy has really come a long way since several years ago. Um, one of the things that struck me when I first came on board last year was just the work ethic. 
And apparently, like I said, it, that wasn't necessarily the case when he first came into the organization, but it's what the organization taught him. But that was the one thing that really stood out to me. And then I think his mental, mental toughness. When he's out there on that mound, you can't tell whether he's frustrated, whether he's having a great game or a horrible game. Um, but this guy is tunnel vision. And, you know, he sees that, you know, sees that seeing the game to the end, you know, right there in his sights every single time he takes them out. Um, I'm not sure if you know this. We actually gave Sandy a contract extension last year. Um, Smart so move. Yeah, signed him to a five-year plus a, a club option. Um, and that was really, you know, in terms of, in terms of, you know, looking at the club and looking what we wanted to do in the future, Sandy was really that first building block, you know, and looking at who we had internally, he was that first building block um, to that foundation and what we're trying to do here. I think that this organization um, is always going to be pitching first. Um, you know, I think the uh, people before me, as well as, you know, I am definitely a run prevention um, advocate. And so this was really the, the pillar to get us started down that let's, path. Let's talk about that. Why that philosophy? Why, why do you have that philosophy? Um, I'm sure there's, there's a success rate to it, but what, what, talk a little bit about that. So I came from two of the most storied franchises in all of professional sports, you know, the Yankees and the Dodgers, the Dodgers for decades and decades, you know, go back to Don Drysdale, Sandy Koufax um, had always been pitching first. Um, my time with the Yankees, I really saw, you know, and I mentioned offense up the middle. Um, however, when you get to the playoffs, it's really the pitching that will take you to the promised land. And so that's why, you know, I mean, it was really, um, you know, when I came on board and, and I took a look at what was really here, it was, um, it was great for me because they had done a lot of things that I truly believe in. And that's, you know, the pitching and, you know, first pitch strikes and ground ball pitchers and those types of things. So it was really um, a dynamic match. So Kim, I just got a question in, <clears throat> which, which goes to your pitching. Does Sandy start the all-star game? In my opinion, he should. Um, <laughs> in my opinion, I do think that Brian Snitaker will make that call. Um, you know, I, I, you know we, we have the unbalanced schedule. We see the Braves 19 times a year, which means he's probably seen Sandy uh, over 60 plus times in the last three to four years. Um, so you'd think that, that he would have a pretty good understanding of who, of, who Sandy Alcantara is. Um, and I, and I really think that, you know, Sandy from Sandy last year was not really a household name. Um, he was still sort of burgeoning and, and up and coming, but I think this year has really solidified his place amongst the most elite in the game. So I, I think, um, I think Snitaker will make that call. With so Sandy. When I go to Chicago, by the way, with you on the uh, Chicago trip, I basically toward Oxfeld. I hope I'm going to get a Sandy jersey. You know, I'm not. I'm you know making my pitch right now in public too for my Sandy jersey. Clearly, clearly he's on the line now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what's the biggest risk you've taken um, in, in your role? The biggest risk I've taken. Um, you know, I, I will say that it. In my opinion, it's not a huge risk, but it's always a risk when you sign a player to a multi-year deal. Um, you know, but I and you know there were some that disagreed with the Sandy deal um, because it was five years for a pitcher. Um, but in my is mind, that is that unusual five years for a pitcher? For a young pitcher, it is. Um, you'll generally see three to four years. Um, time in our industry, we, we definitely did scale back, but then, um, I would say this past off season was semi shocking in terms of the number of long-term deals. I mean, when I say long, I mean, five plus, um, five plus contracts that we saw given out to starting pitchers. So I definitely, once I saw the market evolve for starting pitchers, this off season was incredibly grateful that we got Sandy locked in. Um, but it's all, you know, it's always risky to do a long-term deal. So I, I just got another great question that just came in. It, it basically says, are you surprised by the 
uh, amount the salaries that are going with these new deals? And is it expected? And can the Marlins compete with some of these big contracts? So I have been a little bit surprised at where the market has gone. Um, but, you know, I will say I, I do think it's a function of, um, you know, the business of baseball and how it is growing. Um, and the second part of your question, what was it? Um, are the Marlins going to compete? Oh, the Marlins competing. I, you know, definitely. Look, I think, you know, we are in a very difficult um, division in the National League East. Um, I I could never have told you at the beginning of the offseason that the Phillies would sign both Castellanos and Schwarber. There was no way I could even imagine that, but they did. Um, you know, the Mets obviously went, went out and probably signed five big deals. Um, do I think we can compete? I do. You know, and I think you're seeing it. You know, we just split with the Mets. We've got the Phillies coming into town. The, the um, series earlier this year, we took them three to one. Um, so I think we can compete. We just have to do it in different ways. We have to be better at scouting and player development. Um, that, that's the way for us to compete. We have to make smart trades. We have to make trades sooner than we probably want to, right? We have to do it in a different way than the way, you know, the Mets clearly and the, and the Phillies did this off season, um, you know, just signing, just signing really big contracts and putting those on their books for a really long time. Um, so we just have to do it differently. So let's stay with risk. Let's stay with um, personal risk. Um, what personal risk, what's probably the biggest personal risk you've taken? The, probably the biggest personal, well, it, with, with regards to my career? Yeah, with regards to your career. Um, personally, it would probably be getting married. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. Career-wise, um, career wise, I would say going to Major League Baseball my second time. So I mentioned the first time I went to Major League Baseball, that was, uh, I went to the American League when I was 27 years old. Yeah, 27 years old. Um, but I went to Major League Baseball after my time with the Dodgers. And the reason it was a risk was because, you know, it took me a really long time to make that decision. But the reason it was a risk was because I knew that I might not ever get back to a team because I was so high up the food chain, you know, I was going in at the SVP level and there was really only one other step that, not that I could take. I mean, I, I think I probably could have gone laterally and, and gone to an assistant GM role again, but I had done that for 13 years, right? And so we had never really seen in, in terms of, um, you know, the, the chartered path for executives, we had never really seen an assistant GM go to MLB as an SVP and then come out on the back end, going back to a club. So I think that was a really um, profound decision for me to make. Um, and I had to be comfortable with what could have been the consequences. And that would be to just finish out my career at MLB. Um, and it really did take me, I mean, it took me several weeks to make that decision. And I had others in my life who were saying, what's the problem? You know, the, the Dodgers were going through a fairly tumultuous um, you, you situation. Think? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that that's an understatement. You mean like a revolution going on out there. <laughs> Chaos, unbelievable. Um, the Dodgers. Yeah. And so, it, but, you know, it was the, uh, the, the devil, you know, yeah. um, and I, and you know, and, and my time at the Dodgers was really important as well um, because they were a pioneer in so many different ways. And that, and that part was meaningful to me, right? So to now to step out, um, and we all talk about our comfort zones, but to step out of that comfort zone and be a leader in the central agency, you know, the governing agency, the governing body, you know, which is really supposed to be the leader of the industry. Yeah. So I think there were there were sort of many layers to that decision, um, and it was it was the biggest risk of my career. But um, you know, obviously, it it turned out okay. Yeah, it turned out. I think it's turned out well. So let's talk a little bit about the the conference. So the Mets got off fast, fast start. You know, the Mets kind of seemed to be fading a little bit. The Braves seemed to be coming up. The yeah. Marlins are clearly having position. Um, second half of the season. Can the Mets can the Mets keep it going, and are the Braves just red hot? 
So <clears throat> I would say, you know, the, the Mets just had um, Scherzer come off the IL. Um, so that was a huge boost for them. Um, they've got DeGrom, who, was, who has been on the IL for a couple of months. So he's back. Um, so they really are primed to, to go on a little run here. Um, but I think, you know, the more that, that clubs see them, the more that division rivals see them, you know, there, there are ways to beat them. They are undoubtedly a very good club, though. I okay, well, let's, let, let's take a moment here. You have a lot of players coming off the injured list, too. Yes, and we do. You guys have. So you got the same situation for your run. Yes, we do. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. You know, it's been a tough couple of months enduring those injuries. Um, we've got Soler, Jorge Soler coming off for tonight's game. Um, we actually, this is not an injury, but we do have uh, Max Meyer most likely making a start for us this weekend. So he's Max been, Meyer? Yes. Is David Oxfeld on this call? Because he's been bugging me for several months about Max Meyer. Yeah, so, there's, a, there's a lot of chat about him. Yeah. That's exciting. It's really exciting. This was our number one draft um, in 2020. So really just a short time ago. Um, we're really excited to have this young man up here. He is um, brimming with confidence. I'll put it that way. Um, he's got a really dynamic slider. Um, his changeup has really come on this year and his fastball ranges anywhere from, I would say 96 to 98 miles an hour. So, so it'll be an interesting look this week. Yeah. So as you said, you're you're really believing in the pitching. Absolutely a hundred percent. So let's go back to the Braves just a second. The yep. Braves are hot. Do they stay hot? They do, you know, and I think we saw from last year, um, you know, what Alex Anthopoulos is prepared to do at the trading deadline. Yeah, he basically recreated that entire outfield, um, including, you know, our left fielder was 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 an acquisition and Solaire became the uh, World Series MVP, but Alex basically recreated that that outfield last year. So I think that's, you know, that's something that that you know we definitely have to be mindful. You know, Alex is a definite player at the trading deadline. So I I do think that they're coming on. They have come on in the last month or so. They went on a like a fourteen game streak, win streak. Um, you know, which really just sort of brought them back to the level I think that they were, you know normally going to be at um, they definitely regress to the mean so you know definitely you know a, a very good club so you have those two you have the Phillies eh, um, you're going to take care of them this weekend I'm not worried <laughs> I like no your need thinking. to talk about the Phillies I like your thinking so going back to the injured list um, we've got Solaire coming back um, we've got Jazz Chisholm um, pretty soon after the all-star break um, we've got Anthony Bender coming back after the All-Star break. So we've got some reinforcements coming. So besides having all the baseball skills, we just got this question in and, and having the skills, what else does a baseball player need to be successful? Because, you know, there's a lot of talented athletes who never get to the finish line in, in every sport. So in your role, what do you see as besides skill, what do they need? And then I think it's a great question. How do you, how does somebody like you help them? So, you know, the, the, and I think you see this more as a, you know, as an executive um, higher up the ladder, you know, because you get a little bit closer to the players, you get a little bit closer to the coaching staff. Um, you know, probably what, there are a couple of things. Number one, this is an incredible season. You know, the idea that we play 162 games and, um, and the travel that you know we as as organizations do um, to play 162 games in about 182 days, um, it's really incredible. So there's this idea of the grind, right? And what it takes to physically, not only physically, but also mentally and emotionally, be able to put yourself out there for 162 games is really, I mean, it's, it's an incredible feat every year. Um, so that's, I think the the mental toughness is the, you know, is the one aspect um, that, that maybe fans don't necessarily see, or um, it's, it's not, you know, front of mind for them, but it really is truly a grind. Um, in terms of helping them, um, you know, it's something that, that, 
that I've thought a lot about in, in particular this year. And you know, we, we've dealt with a lot of injuries and, and even that, you know, in and of itself is a mental grind, right? And, and these guys, you know, some of them have had injuries that have lasted quite a long time and longer than we had initially anticipated, but it's how do you get through those types of things? So this idea of mental performance and mental skills has really been on my mind. Um, and it's something that I've thought a lot about and how to help the players. We do have a mental skills coach, but it's definitely an area that, in my opinion, we need to beef up. And it's not just at the big league level, it's throughout the minor leagues. And it's, it's how do you keep these players motivated, even when they're, you know, a lot of times when a player is injured, we don't necessarily keep them up in Miami, we send them to Jupiter but you still have to keep them motivated. So how do you guys keep those guys going on a daily basis when they don't necessarily even see what's out there um, for them um, at, the, you know, at the end of the day? So yeah, that, that's been on my mind quite a bit and <clears throat> really trying to beef up that department this off season. But let's kind of just jump out a little bit of baseball because we're talking about mental health um, and the Olympics. We saw some incredibly interesting mental health issues that have gone on and especially in sports. Um, is there too much pressure on young athletes today or is the expectation so high or is it just, it's too much time on the field? It just, just kind of your point of view, because, um, you, you see a lot of young people coming through and coming up, but sort of your take on the whole athletic, uh, environment. Yeah, that amateur landscape, um, it is really tough. And I think the expectations are way too high. I think the pressure that is, um, you know, that is placed on these kids is just enormous. And it's not just coaches, it's the parents. You know, and obviously, um, you know, we've seen, you know, we've seen the scholarship scandal, right? And, and so this is not even necessarily for pro sports. <laughs> these are not necessarily kids who think that they're gonna play professionally. No, it's the Olympic sports are the worst. Uh, I mean, it's just in, sometimes just to get a scholarship, you know, and parents spend X number of dollars to get their kids a scholarship or just to get them into a certain institution, yeah. right? So I think the pressure on kids is, is incredible these days. Um, and, you know, again, I think, you know, I think this starts at home, really, you know, and, and what, what do parents want for their kids? Um, you know, and I, and I played, you know, intercollegiate sports um, but I never experienced anything like what I see my niece go through. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because my oldest son played soccer at San Diego State. My youngest son plays football at USF. I, we were never those kind of parents, but I used to be out there and amazed at what people were doing or what they would say to their kids. And I was thinking, wow, how are you going to get some 13-year-old or 14-year-old to grasp what you're saying? Just, just back off. You know, it's, it's just too much pressure. Which leads me to a, a, another thing is, do you think being the first female general manager, um, not only the pressure on you, but everybody's watching to see how you lead and how do you deal with that pressure? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I think um, my moves are being watched. The transactions are being watched. I think my staff is watching. Um, I, mean, I think fans are watching. I think they watch what I say. You know, it's, it's all... Um, you know, under the microscope, which is fine. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, and I think that's where having, you know, where my being a veteran of this industry for so long has really helped. And, you know, I've watched four first time general managers go through this process. Um, and I've seen, you know, how they've handled it. I've seen what they've done that has worked. I've seen what hasn't worked. Um, and so, you know, watching that process, and I would say it wasn't, you know, obviously it wasn't firsthand, but it was up close and, and personal um, you know, because I had very good relationships with, with all the general managers that I've worked with. Um, but, you know, I, I will say this, um, having watched it, you know, having had a seat next to these guys when they, they did it and, and hearing what they talk about, you never really have quite the understanding until you actually go through it. And I've caught myself a lot of times saying, that's what he meant. 
you know, this is, this is why he felt this way. Um, and so, you know, but, but I will say it was better to have gone through that process than not. Um, because, you know, for, for the guys that have become general managers for the first time and not really having seen a number of different individuals do it, um, you've only seen it one way and that's just not enough information. I saw it done four ways. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's really helped me navigate these waters. So when you go home at night, how do you vent? What do you say when you go home at night? So when I go home at night, it's almost like I have to have another press conference because my husband interrogates me. Why did we do this? Why did you do this? What was he thinking? Um, no, he's, my husband is great. He, I, he knows the nights when I need a drink. <laughs> um, you know, the, when I go home, um, you know, it really depends on how we did. You know, I, I, you know, obviously we've lost our, our fair share of games. Um, I am okay. Listen, this is a long season. You yeah. know, even the best clubs lose, you know, 70, 75 games. Um, and still may and still and still make it to the playoffs. still make it to the playoffs. So I would I would say this that um, you know you have to be okay with losses. That's that's the nature of this game. I think it's how we lose which really determines my mood. The one run losses. How so, painful is that? When <clears throat> some of those are okay, you know, if we have played a good clean game, they're okay. It's the games where. You, know, you think about the mistakes that you made earlier that you hope do not come back to bite you. Um, those are the games that you, you know, that are um, painstaking and that make your heart ache. Um, and, and the ones that you really don't want to review, but you lose sleep over and you find yourself on the computer at 3 a.m. looking, you know, fig trying to figure out what you can do to help. But um, not that I've had any of those. Um, but you know, the one run games, you know, I will say the our, our one run game record this year is a little bit deceiving. And I'll tell you why. Last year, it felt like we had more blown saves, you know, from our bullpen. This year, we've actually been, um, we've been trailing by, you know, three or four runs, and we've made a really good um, comeback short, the comebacks came back short. Um, but we came, we got to within one run. So I will say that that has been a portion of, of our one run games. Um, we have blown some this year, um, but uh, you know, we've also, you know, you see on in the last couple of nights, we came back in extra innings. Oh, big. You know, had the walk-offs and those are one yeah. run games. So, those are exciting, exciting those, moments. Those, yeah, and those are make you too feel exciting, good. Mark. Too exciting, I can say that. But- um, make you feel great too. Yeah, no, uh, we're definitely excited about the wins. Um, how we get there can be ugly at times, but we get there nonetheless. So, so as, a, as a business executive, right? Well, you know, what would you tell business executives about those one run losses or one run wins? You know, because um, you, you've sort of told us how you deal with it, but when you come into the office the next day, what's the first thing that you do or first thing that you say? Um, I would say, first of all, I think you always have to sleep on it, at least for me. I, I, I never, I really, really, really try not to make big decisions um, that night you know, after the game. Sometimes you inevitably have to, um, but I generally try and sleep on those. Um, you know, look, the next day is, it's a new day. And, and I think you tend to look at things differently. You know, you zoom out. I think a lot of the emotion has been um, swept away in the one hour that you slept. Um, but I, I think it's just a new day, you know, and I think everyone has that, most everyone has that perspective. And then I think you regroup, you know, with, with your cabinet and see how people feel in the morning. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll say this, my best ideas come in the shower you know, because you're just, you're getting ready to start that day and you're, you're thinking about, you know, what, what you want to accomplish and how you're looking at it. Um, and sometimes, you know, it just takes that couple hours of sleep to do it. So that's, that's how I try and deal with it. Um, I think it also, it also helps you to come up with a new list of questions that you should be asking. Yeah. 
right? And that and that's really how you get to probably um, the most robust, best answer. So when you get in the car in the morning after one of those and you come to work, is the radio on or off? It's generally off. And me, I mean, me too, I, by the way. It and, off. I gotta think. Yeah, and and I try and make two to three calls before I get in. Yeah. And, and what kind of car do you drive? What kind of car do you drive? I, I I drive an Audi that I got from Auto Nation. I know. Thank you for your business. <laughs> now, if you could get any car of your choice, Ooh. what would you drive? What kind of mood am I in that day? Well, that's that's got a lot to do with it. But give me an idea today. What car would you want today? You know, today, today, I'd probably want probably want an Audi TT. Very nice. You like the Audi family. I do. I do. We've had several of them and they've been really good to us. Favorite but, color car. Oh, um, you know what? I almost, so is this a lease or do I, do I own it? Lease, lease. Okay. Orange. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. If I get so, to the back, it's orange. So why we stay there with personal choices, who's your role model today? outside of baseball and inside of baseball? Well, I just got a book that she autographed for me. It was sent to me the other day. It's right here by my, I'm not sure if you can see it. Billy oh, Jean. Billie Jean King. Yes. Yes, I just got that gift from her the other day. Um, incredible, incredible person has fought for gender equity, um, pay equity throughout her you know, throughout her adult life, um, has always been a proponent of speaking her mind um, and calling people out and calling wrongs out. So um, was inspirational for me as a kid and through my career. Um, and then inside of baseball, um, inside of baseball, I mean, I have, you know, many mentors, um, um, and role models. I will say one of um, one of my premier mentors has been Joe Torrey. Um, I've worked with Joe at several different spots, um, the Yankees, the Dodgers, and Major League Baseball. And, and, and why Joe? And what, what's the difference? Yeah, there? absolutely. And so, you know, when I was an executive with the Yankees and the Dodgers, I had always heard players talk about Joe, and they'd always say, you know, he is such a great players manager. And we don't really, and so at the Yankees and the Dodgers, I didn't really work for Joe, right? I worked alongside Joe. Um, at MLB, I actually worked for Joe. And I think what that phrase really meant in the players' minds and now in my mind is that, um, you know, Joe sets parameters, but he gives you a lot of freedom to work within those parameters. Um, and he gives you time and the freedom to make mistakes because I think that is probably our greatest teacher. Um, and, you know, it, it basically means Joe was not a micromanager and understood what he did not know and let his people um, experience, make mistakes, flourish, um, but was there to catch you when you needed it. And I will always say this about Joe as well. Um, you know, Joe is a great, um, professor of the human spirit and of, um, you know, and of people. He yeah. understands what makes people tick and what motivates them. And, um, you know, has a way of just looking at a problem and coming up with a, a very simple solution that really has to just, that has to do with human nature and how people behave. And I think that's why he was just such a great manager. You know, I had a chance to meet Billie Jean recently at the Formula One race in Miami. Oh, cool. And um, uh, I had a really interesting discussion with her. And I said to her, I said, what people I hope will always remember for you, about you is that you spoke out, that you had a point of view. And um, I said, what you have done for women is incredible because you've given them a voice. So, you know, thinking about it, Title IX, if I'm not wrong, is having its, its 50th anniversary, it's 50th year. Um, what do you think the lasting results are of that? And do you think it's something that will successfully continue? Are, are we in the right, are we in the right spot with 
with Title IX? You know, I think I think Title IX has um, had tremendous impact, um, not just on sports but on society. Yeah. Um, I, I think you know many of the of the young women and girls that were beneficiaries of Title IX, and so that's you know that is just millions and millions of of us. Um, you know, I'm I'm a beneficiary of Title IX. Um, you know, we 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 have experienced um, the great impact, and 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 I guess when I say that it's you know for all the, the young women and girls who have played sports, it's been huge for us. Yeah. But it's it's really all those other women and young girls who we've you know touched throughout our lives, come across throughout our lives, you know, been role models. Um, you know, given advice to, um, those are the girls that have benefited from Title IX as well, indirectly, you know? So, so it, it's interesting because I talked to my daughter and daughter-in-law about this, right? And my daughter works for AutoNation in California. My daughter-in-law works for the Padres. And they believe that Title IX, not just with sports, but with everything, absolutely. was an, a door opener. And, you know, for example, my daughter has the um, BMW Porsche business for AutoNation, you know, which a young woman in that position for marketing is very unusual. And my daughter-in-law works for the Padres. And they say that Title IX opened doors that people don't even understand what it did. They don't realize at all. You know, and you look at, um, I don't know what the exact figure is, but the number of female CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and how many of them played intercollegiate sports. You know, and, and so then you think of the impact of those CEOs and of course, you know, they're going to want to give um, chances to other women. And so it just trickles down throughout, you know, throughout business, um, you know, teaching, professors, um, you know, business people, doctors, et cetera. I mean, it, it, Title IX and the ability to play sports has given us all um, a tremendous amount of confidence. You know, it's given us, it's helped us to succeed. It's helped us become incredible leaders. And again, those leaders, as you move up the up the ranks, you know, we're looking out for other capable women, and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to hire them um, and give them opportunity. So, before I ask you one final question, I just have to say to our audience: you got to get a chance. You got to go down and see the investments that have made in the stadium. Uh, ownership has done a tremendous job. Um, there's a lot of excitement with these young dynamic players that go on there. The food is great down there. Parking is easy. Um, and, and I really encourage folks to go out and support. This is just a great um, team. And I guess the final question I, I have for you, Kim, is what are some of the personal initiatives that you would like to champion both in baseball and outside of baseball? <clears throat> so, um, I can tell you throughout my years, um, diversity has always been really important for, important to me for obvious reasons. Um, I've served on numerous committees with Major League Baseball, gotten involved in the you know, diversity fellowships that they started, the diversity pipelines that we've started, you know, a lot of the formal programming at Major League Baseball. Um, I'll give you an example, um, actually he was just let go, but Charlie Montoya with the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, we did mock interviews with him prior to him going in for the, um, in for that interview. So it was really, you know, it was about trying to prep those, um, people who were getting interviews to then go and acquire those opportunities. Um, you know, one of the things that we started here since my time with the Marlins, uh, wanted to, we did this at major league baseball as well. Um, STEM is a field or a set of fields that you know, women are not um, necessarily very visible in. There are just very few of us. Um, and at Major League Baseball, we did a Girls Who Code Shadow Day of a lot of our analytics folks and a lot of our um, advanced media folks. So we wanted to start that here. So I have an analytics department of eight to 10 uh, people um, and I say people, it's not just guys. Um, and we brought in 30 young girls um, from about junior high school age and introduced them to our analytics team and allowed them to shadow. And we had, um, we broke it down into four sessions 
and each each uh, we broke out into breakout sessions and they covered four different areas of our analytics department um just to try and get them engaged and yeah, that's super have an understanding of you know what we do here in baseball so those are some of the initiatives that you know i've been particularly interested in um you know obviously the girls and women um you know, dynamic is always going to be very close to my heart. You have a, you have a Women's Day coming up. We do. Tell, we do. tell me, I know, Bob, one more thing. Tell me about Women's Day. So Women's Day, um, what day is Women's Day? August 26th, I think. August 26th. And so I'm we have... Wrong. So um, we have uh, we have reached out to many of the leaders in the community. We invite you know, all of the women um, in Miami and the greater South Florida area to come down to the stadium. And um, we're gonna have a panel as well. And, and I think it's gonna be Caroline, myself, and obviously Rocky um, gonna head up that panel. We're, by the way, we're sending a group of our women down there to participate. Excellent. I love um, exactly what you guys are doing with this. Hey, Kim, I'm going to kick you back to Bob. I'm going to see you tonight. Okay. We're going to win tonight's game. Okay. No doubt about it. We're going to sweep the Phillies. Sandy's pitching. Sandy's He's pitching. I can't shot. miss it. And then I'll be ready to go to Chicago in a couple of weeks. We've got the All-Star break. You're fabulous. You're doing a great job. And uh, I can't encourage people enough. You got to get down there. Get down to see the Marlins. I got my Marlins shirt on. I'm all ready to go. So, Mark, we have Sandy going tonight. Made the All-Star team. We have Max Meyer, 2020 number one draft going tomorrow. And Sunday, we've got Trevor Rogers, who was our Cy, uh, Cy Young. I'm sorry, it's not Cy Young. Rookie of the Year runner-up last year. Ooh. If I, so, well, I might have to come. Yeah. I, I might have to come. Now, tomorrow night, I can't come because I got to go to Inner Miami. Sunday. I might be down for Sunday's afternoon start. There you go. I think so. Bob, I'm going to kick it back to you. Thank you so much. Kim, I'll see you tonight. All right. Take care. Well, thank you so much, Mark and Kim. Uh, great conversation and uh, great to hear uh, the successes of the, of the Marlins. And, you know, it, it's, it's inspiring to hear about your story, Kim, you know, intern to general manager. And I think it's so interesting and inspiring when you're working with interns and showing people the, the business of sports. I want to thank our sponsors again for uh, supporting not only the Leadership Series, but the Business Journal also provides uh, excerpts from these conversations. We really appreciate the Business Journal's support for the Speaker Series, and it's a natural partnership. They're always uh, constantly highlighting trends and people with major impacts on our community. And uh, today's guests are clear examples of those influencers in our community. Um, please check out the coverage at SouthFloridaBusinessJournal.com. And also make sure that you look at the July 29th issue of the Business Journal for a story on the highlights of today's conversation. Um, today's session will be posted on the Alliance website in the coming weeks. There will also be an episode on the Greater Fort Lauderdale uh, Alliance podcast, which is a new uh, development for us that uh, Gail and, and our team have put together. Um, you can listen to these as a podcast. Um, you can go to gflalliance.org slash podcast. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Um, we are adjourned. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and have a great South Florida weekend. Thank you.